ahead and start the recording now. Hi, everyone. I'm Barb Cardell. I'm the training director for PWN USA. Thank you for joining us for another one of our remarkable gender justice training final presentations. And today we have Sophia Cass, and she's going to be talking to us about why transgender justice matters in 2021. Just want to let everybody know that we are in webinar mode so that we can go ahead and get a really good recording of Sophia's presentation. Um, we have gone ahead and unmuted everybody. And so if you do have a question, um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. And I will also be keeping an eye on the chat box. And so if there's a question that you would like me to ask when Sophie comes to a break in, in her presentation, I can go ahead and do that as well. So thank you again for joining us. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Sophia. Thank you, Barb. And thank you for uh, making the introduction easier for me. Uh, so hi, everyone. As Barb said, my name is Sophia Cass. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. Um, and today we're going to be discussing why transgender justice uh, actually still matters in, in 2021. Um, so Barb went, went over a little bit of housekeeping, um, which I'm not going to go over again for the sake of time. Um, but I'm going to move to the objectives that we hope folks, um, you know, by the end of this presentation uh, will, will reach. And so we hope, you know, that folks will be able to define and understand the foundation of trans justice, uh, to use correct terminology when talking about or talking to trans people. Um, also, we hope that folks will get to a point where they can distinguish and discuss two things, the complexity and the intersectionality of trans justice. And finally, we hope that folks will uh, and allies will be able to replicate some of the examples or best practices that we're gonna be discussing. As for the outline, um, we're starting with a few definitions of a sample of gender identities. Um, and we're gonna use the gender unicorn and the gender spectrum to help us discuss that. Uh, we're gonna move to language and why and how uh, the, the correct use of language actually matters and including um, the correct and right use of pronouns. Uh, we're gonna move on to MIPA, how actual MIPA for our trans communities of color should look like in our movement spaces. And finally, we hope to get to an understanding of how and why trans justice is actually an integral part of gender justice. All right, so let's start with a few uh, definitions of a sample of different gender identities. Um, some folks might know this definition already. Uh, and so transgender people are people whose um, actual gender identity is different from the gender identity that they were given or thought to be at birth. And so following this definition, for example, a trans woman is actually a woman who at birth was given the gender identity of male. Um, wrongly, might I add. And likewise, um, a transgender man is actually a man uh, who at birth was given, wrongly, uh, the gender identity female. Um, agender folks do not identify with any gender and um, two-spirit folks, um, their gender identity has a combination of both male and female genders. Um, Non-binary folks, um, their gender identity exists outside of this binary um, of male and female. And finally, um, there's multiple terms that, you know, some folks that have a combination, some, some kind of, comp some form of another or another combination of uh, male and female gender identities that use such as gender queer or gender fluid. All right, so um, I want to add a small and very important nuance actually to these, um, to these different terms. You know, even though, um, you know, this terminology or, or this language is, is widely agreed upon um, and widely used in our community, sometimes it might still feel um, as a label that it that is too restrictive. Um, and so I'm going to take the first one, trans woman. Um, even, you know, even, even though it's accurate, um, 
it cannot simply encompass all of the gender identities um, that women of trans experience can have. And so that is to say, you know, that language sometimes tries to keep up with, with all of who we are as people. Um, and maybe it falls short. Um, now to, to explore this a little bit further, um, let's move to the next slide and talk about the gender unicorn and um, the gender bubbles or gender spectrum. I love the gender unicorn tool uh, because it's a visual way of, break, of breaking down um, our different identities or gender identities and um, our human interpersonal attractions. And so if you look, it, the, it shows you the different components or building blocks, right? Um, so the gender identity uh, visual, as visualized by the bubbles and the rainbow, um, you know, it's internal, it's in our spirit, um, in our soul. Um, gender expression, if you look on the left of the unicorn, you see, you know, the dots green in green. And so that is to signify that um, it's external, one. And two, you know, it's how we present ourselves in the world. The, the you know, the gender expression or our expression, the expression, sorry, of our gender in the world. Um, mind you that even this expression changes with time, let's say um, wearing pants or with, uh, with geography. I believe, for example, in Scotland, um, you know, men, um, or, although they don't like to call them skirts, but maybe they're called quilts, uh, but you get the example. And Third is uh, the gender, like we mentioned on this previous slide, uh, the gender that we were given, um, oft more often than not wrongly given. And finally, um, two different of two types of attractions, the physical and emotional attraction. An example to, to kind of embody those, um, this duality in, 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 um, in human attraction, uh, usually open couples, for example, um, agree that um, we have one relationship or one entity we commit to each other or one commitment. Um, and at the same time, uh, which is the emotional part, and at the same time, they give each other, um, you know, the permission to um, be physically attracted and maybe have physical relations with people outside of, of this entity or this emotional entity. All right. So, what I also like about the gender unicorn is that just by simply looking at these different building blocks, right? Um, I remember in math, there, were, there was an, ex, um, an, um, um, an equation that they taught us that I completely forgot and I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, but basically, you know, that helps us know how many combinations can exist between these different building blocks, right? Even without using that um, equation, I can already tell you that it's almost infinite. Um, one such combination can be, for example, um, you know, my gender identity is female, my gender expression is masculine, or you know, what is considered to be masculine in society. Um, the gender that my parents or the doctor gave me at birth was um, female. I'm physically attracted to men, but I'm emotionally attracted to women. Um, and like we said, this is only one of, I think, an infinite uh, universe of gender identities and identities. Um, another way to look at this is if you look on the right side of the screen, um, you know, let's say two transgender individuals or two individuals existing in the female gender identity bubble or the pink bubble. Now imagine how many places in this bubble these two individuals can be or even travel, including maybe the same spot, or for example, an intersection with the agender bubble or the orange bubble or the gender fluid bubble, uh, the green bubble or the male bubble, the blue one or all of them, like in the middle, uncertain and or all. Um, and on top of that, like we said, I used the word travel inside a bubble because, you know, that can also change for one individual, for the same individual, not just throughout the course of their lifetime, but also throughout the course of 
um, one day, for example. Um, and so if I have a, I want you to take away, if, you know, from these two slides um, is, you know, sometimes our use of language um, for lack of any other um, maybe language is, can be, can seem to be narrow uh, because, you know, when we think about gender identity, I'd like to encourage folks to, to really think about the huge universe of all the possibilities of who we can be as people um, or who, what gender we can identify um, in or with as people. All right, so moving on to language um, and, and why and how the right use of language um, matters. On the left or in red, um, I put a lot of um, examples of language I've heard being used in, in even in our movement spaces. And so just like you wouldn't say, um, I hired a transgender at my organization, um, you would say I hired a transgender person, um, you know, the plural of that is transgender people. And so, you know, going back to people first language, um, you know, do not take our humanity from us, basically. Um, transgendered <laughs> actually does not exist, so it's transgender. Um, now, I want to pause a little on the term biological sex. Um, throughout this, co the, this conversation or this presentation, um, I will give, we will give a few examples of arguments that we hear on the other side of the aisle, or let's say um, the political right, and the counter arguments or what actually is. And so one of the one of such arguments that we hear on the other side of the aisle is, you know, you cannot change uh, nature, you cannot change biology or genetics. One that is true, you know, if you could, <laughs> so many places in my genetics, I would change. Um, and two, even in the natural world, you know, an existence of a certain set of chromosomes does not always correlate with a certain gender or gender identity, right? So in nature, there's something that's called um, environmental gender determination. And so when certain factors or conditions exist um, in an environment, even let's say, you know, we were, thought, we were taught, um, you know, that XY correlates with the male gender. Even if XY exists within those conditions or environmental factors, um, the gender of, of the embryo before birth can change. Or even sometimes, even let's say clownfish, the gender of the living being after maturity can also change. And so, you know, that argument that we often hear from conservative, um, you know, the conservative side is actually not accurate nor valid. Um, and that's why actually the right terminology would be assigned gender at birth, right? Like we said in the previous slides, the gender we were given by our doctor, our parents, our family, et cetera. Um, and applying, you know, this, this term, you know, we can say AMAB or AFAB assigned male at birth and assigned, assigned sorry, female at birth. And personally, I actually prefer these two term, you know, these two uh, language use because they're actually, if you think about it, more inclusive of all of the, uh, you know, of all of the gender identities um, that exist in the trans, let's say, universe or simply in the universe. Um, you know, they can, um, that includes, you know, trans women, trans men, non-binary, etc. All right, so. Part of the right use of language is also the right use of pronouns. Um, uh, a simple way to look at pronouns is, you know, if I tell you, hello, my name is Sophia, and um, you are inventing another name for me, or even sometimes worse, you're giving me a nickname, um, I'm not going to like you that much. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not helpful and even offensive. And another idea that, um, as trans folks, more often than not, we go about life um, and whether it's a small portion or a bigger portion of our lives fighting for and actually having to convince the world that we exist, you know, to prove our existence. Um, 
some of the some of us in the movement have also made that like our, our bread and butter to fight for the right um, to exist and to navigate the world just like any other trans a non trans person. And so by this simple, you know, what you consider or they consider to be a simple mistake, um, you are kind of saying that we don't exist and we, you are negating our whole existence, which is in itself um, a form of violence. Moving on to the next slide. Um, again, I wanna thank Barb for uh, sharing with me this report uh, published by UNAIDS in 2020. And so, I put it, uh, I, you know, I put it up because I wanted to show um, that, you know, for example, in this report, the writers are talking about the different approaches that can support women and girls in the context of COVID-19. And so if you look at the text, and I, I did put it on purpose, the writers went, you know, the additional length or all the way to try and include um, and describe all the diversities um, of women and girls, right? Let's go to the other side of the aisle where we sometimes hear oh, politically correct language. It's so complicated, it's so complex and like it takes forever. It's, it's a waste of time, right? Well, going, coming back to the slides, um, when we actually do take this effort to, to name, um, you know, and describe all of at least try um, all of the diversity in which people can exist um, in or under. Um, it is actually very empowering, um, and not only you know it's inclusive, but it's also you know we're seen, um, and particularly you know in our field of work, where um, our goal hopefully is to empower the people we are working with and to see them as partners, as leaders. All right, so we talked about um, the huge gender <laughs> uh, universe, and we talked about uh, the right use of language. So now let's move on to MIPA and how uh, MIPA should actually look like for our trans communities of color within uh, our movement. Uh, again, some folks might know this information. Um, how did MIPA start? In 1983, a group of 12 um, predominantly white cisgender uh, men uh, protested at the fifth gay and lesbian um, health summit. And in their, in their protest, they, they uh, put forth a manifesto that contained a set, a set of principles that became known as the, Gen the Denver principles based on you know, where this conference was located in Denver, Colorado. This manifesto is a, was a way for them to reclaim the driver's seat or reclaim the, their power of leadership. And um, it talked about, you know, the rights of, and responsibilities of, at the time, you know, the terminology used was people uh, with, living with AIDS um, and the rights and responsibilities of people providing service to, to, to people with AIDS and their communities. Um, the Denver principles and this manifesto um, later on in the 90s, um, morphed into what we now know as a GIPA, greater involvement of people with um, HIV and AIDS, or MIPA, meaningful involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, GIPA is more on the global scale, whereas MIPA is more on the US national scale. Um, the overarching um, theme of the Denver principles were that basically nothing about us without us is for us. So basically, sorry, I keep saying basically, but um, English as second language. Um, you know, we have the right uh, to form our own caucuses, to be our own leaders, spokespeople, strategists, representatives. Um, we have the right to be involved at uh, all levels of decision-making in the organizations that serve us, including boards, for example. And we have the right to be heard um, and share our experiences and knowledge, let's say in AIDS conference uh, or AIDS farm settings um, without our credib credibility being questioned or challenged because we live uh, with HIV and AIDS. 
All right, and um, here's an example of MIPA and how even the concept of MIPA evolved from the 80s uh, till today. Um, <clears throat> this is great, uh, but even in the beginning and still now, there's ongoing challenges to, to actual MIPA, particularly for our communities of color. Uh, one of the most evident challenges, ongoing challenges, is actually um, that the leadership of black and brown communities, um, of traditionally marginalized communities, you know, women, trans folks, people who um, use drugs, people who engage in sex work, notice I'm saying people first, um, you know, uh, immigrants, people who are immigrants, um, that, that leadership is often invisible. And actually, it's kind of seemed that um, the blacker and more feminized um, this epidemic became, that this initial principle, you know, that this initial um, reclaiming of our leadership that was set forth uh, in Denver in the 80s um, wavered, right? Um, we also know that that is because of, of racism, anti-Blackness, and all of the, the isms. Um, and um, it's just a lack of, of intersectional approach and a lack of understanding that the predisposition to acquire, for a person to acquire HIV and AIDS, um, or if that person is already living with HIV and AIDS, the predisposition to have worse health outcomes is actually you know, embedded and, and, and structured by racism, anti-Blackness, misogyny, you know, all these isms. And so on top of that lack of intersectional approach um, and the absence or the erasing of leadership, um, we are always put in the consumer seat, right? The recipient seat. Um, and this is sometimes even manifested in what we call, or what is called AIDS Inc. or professionalization. I said it um, slowly because I can't say it quickly. Um, and so an example about that, I happen to live in San Francisco. And um, let me tell you, there's no, um, uh, lack of, of um, service providing agencies or CBOs um, for people living with HIV and AIDS in San Francisco, at least. Um, and so I'm looking for work right now. And if you look at the job descriptions and the you know, qualifications requirements they ask for, most of the times, more often than not, um, you know, they ask for a degree in psychology or um, um, cl clinical psychology or social studies or, or public health. And so, you know, that is actually how systems are put in place to prevent us from accessing those jobs and having therefore influence in, in that work um, and how systems are put in place to keep us in the consumer seat and to raise our leadership as a result. All right, so by now um, we, we know what works and what does, know, does not work for um, like for actual MIPA for our trans communities of color. We know that what works is a willingness to change, is to increase representation and leadership um, of um, the representation of the leadership of our communities of color um, at every level and all throughout the levels of an organization. Um, and when we are seen as leaders, we are seen as partners and we are centered in the response um, not just in the response, but also in the leadership. And on the other side, what does not work is uh, to have a rigid or change phobic um, organizational structure. Sometimes even they say it's um, related to a lack of buy-in from, from executive leadership. And what does not work, especially what does not work is the lack of this intersectional lens. And so oftentimes the, that the lack of that lens is portrayed by um, ambiguity in statements, you know, commitment statements when talking about racial and trans justice and empowerment. Um, and even worse, a pervasive anti-Blackness that also um, is shown by race neutral and color blind, blind narratives. All right, Sophie, so, okay, I'm an organization and I want to know what concrete steps I can take um, to get there, to get to actual MIPA for trans communities of color. Um, 
So in front of you on the slides, you know, by no, by no, by no means are these um, like the only steps an organization can take. Um, I just try to brainstorm, you know, based on what I know and um, what I've heard in community um, and give some examples of those. Um, so a, a crucial step to, to get there um, is involvement at all levels. And so what that means that, you know, our trans communities of color are involved from the beginning, from the conception of an idea or let's say um, or, um, proposal writing process um, throughout each step along the way, including implementation and even after. Even better than this step is actually ownership. And so that means that as an organization, we are going to the community who owns the, you know, who knows um, what our needs are and in what order, you know, we need those needs, the priorities, um, who also knows the, how to get there, you know, the, the solutions for those. Um, as an organization going to the community and providing what non-trans organizations oftentimes have, which is exposure, uh, funding, um, networking, um, technical capacities and, and, and development. And the ownership is in the community. Um, another step that works, um, you know, in the staircase is to have economic justice. Um, which is basically to have people compensated for the labor and work they are doing, not just by doing stipends. Um, and I can tell you that so much, so frequently I've heard among, you know, among um, community members that please don't give us any more stipends. Um, you know, stipends can sometimes feel uh, transactional and, uh, you know, we're just considered as participants or attendees. Um, whereas a way to replace stipends would be to use consultancies, uh, to use contracts, MOUs, whatever you want to call them. Um, and these are not just, you know, um, resume builders, but also inherently, you know, they assume that there's a power to the expert you are consulting. Um, they, they have an influence. Um, and when you sign in the bottom, you are committing to listen to those consultants and experts, hopefully. Um, another step uh, towards, um, towards actual MIPA uh, is uh, no tokenism, um, which is basically when you keep going to the same person and expecting them to talk on behalf of um, the whole community. Um, and I should say, you know, I should add that this in itself is also a form of abuse. Um, one other step is to have power balance. And um, I've seen a lot of organizations that do it, do it right in a way, you know, when, when we're talking about hiring, when we're talking about um, meaningful, some form of meaningful involvement. But when it comes to the high stakes decisions, um, you know, trans folks, particularly black and brown trans folks are, are not included, uh, don't have a say in those high stakes decisions. And so power balance means the share of the sharing of power uh, particularly, you know, when an organization is deciding, do we go right or do we go left, right? So it's, it's an altering, uh, it's a course altering decision. It's that important as an example. Um, one more step that, um, that works is to have structural change. Um, and when you do that, you actually are building into your organization a process or a mechanism um, where trans people, uh, particularly folks of color, can plug in, you know, different, different ways to plug in into the system you are putting in place. And so, um, you know, you are also providing an opportunity for folks uh, to have a say in how things are going, or if things aren't going the way we want them to go, to have a course correction. Um, and the last step would be long-term commitment which is, you know, um, MIPA is not just when things are trendy or even MIPA is not sometimes or occasionally. You know, MIPA should be all the time. And um, more than that, um, the more, um, you know, as you go, as you advance in time, the more 
you add systems in place, the more you give people opportunities, structural opportunities to plug in, um, the more you are expanding this MIPA concept throughout your organization. When I talk about this, I don't know why I visualize like a biscuit when, when, you, when you drop it in, um, in tea. You know how like uh, tea gets everywhere, infuses everywhere in the biscuit. Um, that's exactly how, you know, when you, imbibe, when you dip uh, the structure in, in MIPA for trans people and it infuses everywhere in the organization. All right. By the way, biscuits, um, I mean cookies, because I know biscuits can mean something else. Um, this slide is just a, another reminder, you know, to use people first language. Um, if you look on the left, uh, most terminology is starting by the virus, you know, with the virus, um, which we are not, right? We are persons, we are people. And even for me, a personal worst, is cluster, you know, or infected. Cluster honestly makes me feel like I'm a microbe in some Petri dish squeezing with other microbes or something like that, you know, where in fact, we're, we're people in a community. All right, so we get to our last section of the presentation, which is, um, you know, why and how trans justice is actually an integral part of, of gender justice. Um, so here's a question that hopefully is, is a thought, um, thought provoker. Um, what is it like for trans people talking to other trans people about, or to other cisgender people about gender justice or gender versus trans people talking to other trans people or to, to siblings about transgender, or about, sorry, gender justice or gender? And I put up this question because um, you know, oftentimes when trans people are discussing gender and gender justice with non-trans folks, it feels like we have to break it down um, into really small components, um, uh, sometimes even maybe simplify. And we also feel that, um, you know, if we add the nuances that exist by the way, but if we add too many nuances, we might lose um, you know, the cisgender person that we're talking to somewhere, somewhere along the conversation. Um, and so I borrowed this from Tiami, um, who borrowed it from Anand. <laughs> um, but basically, I put it up uh, to say that, you know, the journey for a cisgender person to, you know, from, from the place where the thought is, oh, there's only two genders, uh, to the place where, you know, we have a realization and aha moment that gender is actually a construct put forth by patriarchy to control our bodies and may mo make more money. So this journey is actually a two people effort. You know, um, oftentimes we, we witness uh, cisgender folks, you know, going directly to transgender people and asking them um, questions that sometimes are um, insensitive. Let me use that word. Um, and so that is to say that, like I said, it's a two person effort and that cisgender people should do their own research first um, to expand their knowledge. Maybe second, go to a cisgender, another cisgender person that has more knowledge about this topic. And finally, when the level, the plane is level, go to, you know, have a conversation with the trans person about gender or, or gender justice. And so, you know, that's a way of, of harm reduction. Um, and that is, you know, because some of the misconceptions of, of transitioning, for example, that cisgender folks have is, you know, that a trans, I keep saying, you know, uh, that transgender folks um, have to go through all of these phases of transitioning, you know. <laughs> psychological, legal, social, medical. Whereas, you know, oh my God. Um, I'm gonna pause for a second. Whereas trans folks don't necessarily have to go through any of these um, transition steps. Um, we can just realize that we are trans. 
Um, and usually after the realization of our identity, the questions we ask ourselves, the question we ask ourselves is, um, what is what is the world going to think? How are they going to react because of the violence we oftentimes experience? Um, and so a transgender person, their identity is true and valid and should be upheld wherever they are in their transition journey, whether or not you think they look like the part or whether or not you think uh, they sound what you think they should sound like or what you think they should look like. Um, and finally, you know, to close this down, who I say I am is true and valid at any and all phases of, of my transition. And as we discussed earlier in this presentation, a simple way of uh, doing that is using name tags um, or doing a round of introduction. Hello, my name is dot 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 and my pronouns are this and this. I put up this picture before we dive into the injustices that trans people uh, experience and before we dive into what gender justice and trans justice is, transgender justice is. Um, because I see a lot of versions of this picture um, and I'm sure you have on, on social media. Um, I wanted to discuss some stuff that I like in this particular one and some stuff that I actually don't like. And so what I think is accurate in this picture is the depiction of reality. If you look at the, the purple wearing person, oftentimes our trans communities of color don't have to start, you know, have to start from underground and not even from the ground. It also shows that, you know, look at how many boxes uh, the person wearing the blue shirt is standing on. And so most of the times, a lot of resources go to the, to the people or to the places that don't actually need them. What I also think is accurate about this picture is the depiction of the quality, which is a false approach. And the depiction of equity as a first step um, in the right direction. But really, our goal should be towards liberation which is, you know, forget about all of these boxes, um, the resources allocation and the infighting sometimes. Um, my sister Octavia calls it the crab in the battle and the barrel mentality. Instead of putting these resources on the boxes, putting all of the resources on the fence, which is the barrier. Um, so we can all have a, the same view to, of the baseball game. Um, what I don't like now about this depiction is that they are showing three people of different sizes, uh, heights, I mean. Um, assuming that the trans communities have the, or communities most traditionally marginalized, um, have the shorter heights, as if the barriers are in us, inherent in us, whereas the barriers are systemic, they're external. And so if I were to repaint this, I would um, put the three individuals with the same height and the fence, instead of having a horizontal fence, I would tilt it in a way that people with privilege and access have a short fence and our trans communities of color have a way higher fence. And talking about reality, I wanted to show um, some numbers published by the National Center for Trans Equality in a discrimination survey they did in 2015, 2016. And I also intentionally kind of kept the, the title uh, because it's, for me, it was really accurate, you know, injustice at every corner. Um, we're not gonna go uh, through each and every of these, of these graphs. I just wanted to give an idea of the different, um, um, injustices that we face in, in different settings, like high school settings, or when we have to present in the wrong gender at work, um, or when we are denied housing. Um, and on top of that, another, I specifically put this study in, specific, in, in um, particular uh, because it approaches those questions with an intersectional approach. And it actually shows you how anti-blackness and racism um, actually magnifies 
um, the challenges and barriers that we face as a community. Um, this is another uh, slide of, of the same. And um, in this one, I, I wanted to show um, the, the discrimination our trans communities face um, in, in accessing health insurance or um, when providers refuse to, to provide us care. Um, if you go to the website and look at the survey, you, there's another number, uh, you know, how, how, um, how our communities um, have to delay care um, that we need because of this discrimination. And the last one is um, the violence that we, uh, our communities of color um, experience on the hands of police. And talking about intersectionality, if you look at the health insurance by race one, um, you can say you can see that black folks are more often than not likely to be uninsured or to be on public insurance than to have private insurance. Where um, you know, as compared to white uh, folks who are more likely to be on private insurance. And here, you know, is the intersectionality that we were talking about. All right. So, what is gender justice? For me, the slides can be summarized in really three keywords. Um, first, it's systemic. Second, it's intersectional. And third, it centers the leadership of our most impacted communities. So it becomes an intersectional redistribution of power, opportunities, access that is intersectional. I said systemic, that is intersectional. And so it doesn't exist outside of racial, queer, immigration, all of the intersections and isms. And third, centering the leadership of black and brown communities, uh, immigrant communities, indigenous folks, other people of color. And why gender justice? Simply put, it's a human right. And as an organization, you know, whatever your mission is, um, the way to, to get there, you know, the, the vehicle on this road uh, to reach that where you want to get is actually gender justice and cannot be separate um, from, from having a gender justice lens or approach. And finally, what is transgender justice? It's simply our right to exist. It's also um, a justice, a gender justice that loves all of who we are as trans people or all, all of that makes us as trans people. On, on the other side of the aisle, um, oftentimes we hear arguments like um, um, trans rights are as opposed or erase uh, women rights or women empowerment. Where actually this is a really false narrative because transgender justice is an integral part. And here's why. Um, let's take one value, which is um, the right to have gender expression the way you choose. If we uphold that, that right of gender or principle of gender expression, it's two birds, one stone kind of thing. So we are upholding the right and creating spaces for cisgender women to express their gender and all of the different possibilities they choose and we are giving the rights and spaces for trans folks to express their gender in all of the different possibilities that they choose. Another uh, undivisible um, value is bodily autonomy and self-determination. We cannot really separate between a woman's right to choose um, to have uh, information uh, about her health care or access or reproductive justice or safe access to abortions. Um, instead of using reproductive justice, I actually mean uh, reproductive uh, and sexual health care. Um, so we cannot really separate this value from um, the right of a trans person for self-determination uh, to choose to have um, access to safe abortions, um, all of those that I already named. It's actually, you know, our values unite us. It's our common ground. 
And if you think about it, even though you know cisgender folks and transgender folks might be different in some places, we share much more in our values than actually uh, separates us. And on this message of unity and hope, um, I uh, finished my presentation for today and open the floor um, for conversations. Outstanding, Sophia. Thank you so very much. That was a real tour de force of an amazing amount of knowledge that is so, so important. Um, just wanted to let everyone know that you are able to unmute yourself if you would like to ask Sophia a question. We have another um, 10 minutes that we can go ahead and do questions. And while people are coming off of mute to, to ask a question, I'm going to go ahead and read one that somebody sent to me. Um, can you talk again about why pronouns are so important, why they're both about uh, respect as well as about safety? Um, that's a great question. And like I mentioned on that slide, it really is about, like you said, Barb, respect, um, safety, and it's about our existence. Um, when you deny our existence, you do not make us feel safe. Um, when you tell us that who we say we are is some invention or is not true or is not valid, um, we are not safe, we are not included. And so pronouns might seem like three letters, you know, or two letters, but in actually what's behind them is, is more important, you know, and the upholding of these identities is shown by the upholding of our pronouns in a lot of, in a lot of circumstances. Great. Did I answer the question? You did. You absolutely did. Thank you. Thank you so much. And anyone else have questions? We have a note from Natalia that says, um, "I love the idea." to have cisgender women and a transgender person present a training about the understanding of the intersectionality we, spake, we faced as a whole and how gender justice can go both ways. And I think you addressed that very nicely. And, and it is a, a, an intriguing next training topic for us to come up with. And I appreciate that because it is oftentimes um, seen as a very siloed kind of way to talk about uh, both reproductive justice and gender justice is like, this is for this group and this is for this group and yeah. so come together as a whole, that, that's fine. Yeah. Tammy, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? No questions, I'm just in awe over here. <laughs> like, if you were nervous, Oh my God, Sophia, like for real, for real. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, I, great job. I have no critiques whatsoever, <laughs> whatsoever. I really, uh, I mean, like you, you did what, what a trainer does uh, when you felt yourself getting flustered or whatever the case may have been, you paused and you collected yourself. I mean, then you went right back into it. So you were very well prepared. Um, you knew what you wanted to say for each slide. So kudos on that. Um, great job. It, everything that you have worked on, it shows in this presentation and you're already getting asked to present somewhere else um, yeah. in the chat. So, <laughs> so oh, yeah, you will be that. hearing from us. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Tiami and, and, and Sophia, you did just a remarkable job. Yeah. And just to let everyone know, Sophia is now part of our RISE Gender Justice Training Cohort. And um, we are going to be offering gender justice trainings throughout PWN as well as in HIV adjacent spaces, um, PWN and, and other HIV uh, H adjacent spaces. And so if you have a fantastic opportunity and especially if you have a group that needs to really have a good thorough understanding of the importance of the intersectionality around transgender justice 
and transgender and gender justice and why it matters in 2021, we would be happy to connect you with Sophia because this was just probably one of the best, one of the best uh, presentations and, and uh, that I have seen around just this broad overview. So great job. Great Does job. Know this how to is share screen. <laughs> yeah, I'll go ahead and stop. Okay. This is Tana. Sophia, I have to say, I learned a lot and I loved it. It, it was informative for me as, as a cis woman. Um, I mean, you explained it and you broke it down in simple language that was uh, very informative. And I love the piece of around uh, the language matters. I think that is something that um, we as uh, cis women, that piece I think is something that uh, needs to be shared more on the why language matters uh, to the trans community. So great job. Thank you, Tana. Hi, Sophia, this is Wanda Brenda Moss. Um, powerful, just powerful. And I, I second what Tana said, um, that you broke things down into a very understandable, um, uh, you know, where anybody could understand it. Um, and, and that's very important um, because language does matter. Um, acknowledging who you are and how you want to use to be addressed and what I, that matters. And, and you, you just did it beautifully. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Barb, I think you're muted. Yeah. Thank you. I sure am. <laughs> just trying to make sure I didn't uh, <laughs> intrude. And there I was just talking away. Um, so just want to remind everybody that this is Sophia's final presentation. So we have put the link in the chat box for you to go ahead and do a review so that Sophia can get some good feedback around upcoming and building upcoming presentations and possibly some areas that she might want to work on. Um, we do this for all of our final presentations. And so we'll appreciate the time. We'll also send it out in an email for people who are maybe on their phone and don't have their chat. So if you're sending that, feedback, put the you know thing first. So, cause I wanna work on that. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> That's the way we grow and that's the way we grow and really stretch ourselves, right? Is the, you know, the areas to improve upon. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and thank Sophia for an outstanding presentation. Thank all of our other Rise Gender Justice trainers for being on, a real showing of support from, from everyone. And um, just to let you know that this has been a two year program for PWN where we have brought on uh, gender justice trainers and we are seeking to really um, support people and have experts in the field that are um, ready to go. And we are just pleased as can be with how successful this program has been. And as you can see, we've got a remarkable group of, of trainers, including Sophia. So thank you so much. Congratulations on a job really well done, Sophia. Hopefully you can take a deep breath. And um, with that, it looks like we got some congratulations in the chat box. And other Thank you, than everyone. That, so, Tammy, did you have a last thought you wanted to add before we go? No, no. Thank you all for being here. All right. Sophia, the last word is to you then as our presenter. <sighs> um, just thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, everyone's attendance and, um, you know, presence to the, to the end of the, the, the presentation. Um, and I hope that I was able to um, do my job as, a, as a, a potential trainer, you know, to get to the goals and objectives that we talked about in the beginning. Outstanding. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, have a great afternoon, and uh, we will see you see you soon for our next uh, final presentation coming up quickly. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.